Welcome back. I'm Gary Parr, and you are listening to Fiber Talk, that twice-weekly podcast for people who do the fine art needle and thread thing. And our guests this week from Needlework Press are Vicki LaPiccolo Janet. Hi, Vicki. Hi, Gary. How are you today? I'm okay so far. And then Megan Janet. Hi, Megan. Hello, Gary. There we go. Thanks for doing this. I've been, uh, we've been talking about doing this for a long time, but uh, I'm most curious because you guys have a rather unique business and so anxious to learn about what you do. Sounds good. Thank you. Yes. And this show sponsored by Sassy Jacks and Kim Young, Sassy Jacks. So we appreciate that. And uh, just a little update here on all, there's a ton of things going on with, with Sassy Jacks. So they're going to be the host shop for the Primitive Stitcher Society in 2020. Uh, coming up August 2 through 4, they have, uh, Kim has the Beth Seal from Summer House Stitchworks class. And just go to Sassy Jack Stitchery, get on their mailing list, and go to sassyjackstitchery.com and, to get all this information. So August 2 to 4, Beth Seal, Summer House Stitchworks, and that's going to be a finishing class. So if finishing freaks you out, go to this thing and Beth will help you. And then Kim has coming up in September the uh, Soiree Stitch Retreat. And this is just a, a 60 bucks food and a place to stitch in that upstairs room. And there's no project. You bring your own stuff, bring your own whips, and uh, sit there and stitch with a bunch of your friends and have food and drink. And it's a beautiful place. That room is just gorgeous with a lot of daylight, a lot of ceiling light, restrooms right there on the same floor. And down below, Sassy Jacks and the uh, quilt shop. So when you're tired of stitching, you go down and spend money. That's how that works. And then uh, reminding everybody who's going to do the Queen Sampler with Vana and me that uh, Sassy Jacks has a kit. So the threads and linen discount price is 150 bucks, And then uh, the Darlene Osteen chart, which comes from Needlework Press, uh, 50 bucks, And Linda Vinson's stitch guide that comes from Linda Vinson, 26 bucks. So the whole kit, 226 And by the time this is posted, Vaughn and I will have at least started something, I'm sure. And then remember from uh, the Sampler Sunday that Vaughn and I did, that uh, all these samplers mentioned in the podcast for that show, uh, 15% for the full kits from uh, Sassy Jacks. So don't forget that. That's ongoing. And by the time this is posted, there will be a page at the Sassy Jacks site to help you order for those. I think there's 13 different samplers, three of them needlework press samplers, uh, that are offered with a 15% discount for the kits. So... All of that going on at Sassy Jacks, and we appreciate Kim and the folks at Sassy Jacks making these things possible. Back to Vicky and Megan. Okay, so you, you, we've got the we have the uh, the antique sampler part, reproduction sampler part, but then you do the uh, you print up you, the press part. You print books. You have some books. You have uh, uh, little notebooks. All kinds of little things that go along with just samplers. And that's what, to me, that's what makes you guys fun. How does this all get started? And Vicki, I assume you have been a, a sampler addict forever. Actually, it all started with my parents, Gary. <laughs> um, as a child, they drugged my sister and I to antiques shows up and down the East Coast. Oh. Now, unfortunately, my sister and I spent our money on Barbie dolls instead of samplers in the 1960s. Um, but it we was did a thing. It's okay. <laughs> yeah, well, we still have the Barbie dolls. I haven't washed the clothes yet for Megan's daughter, but we still got the Barbie dolls. Um, I think I washed the clothes. Did you wash them? I'm pretty sure. Megan's the boss, in case anybody's wondering. Megan's the boss. Um, I may have started this, but I wouldn't be functioning today without Megan. So as a child, I had an appreciation for samplers, and as I got older, inherited a few from my family, and started noticing them at antique stores and picking up orphan samplers and giving them a home has been a passion for probably 30 years. And about 20 years ago, I got the idea, hey, 
these could make wonderful products, not only the charts, but related printing materials and needlework press was off and running. So did your mother stitch or was she more of a collector? Yes, both my mother and grandmother stitched. My grandmother cross stitch, my mother needlepoint. Unfortunately, I'm very allergic to wool. So at the time, most needlepoint fibers were wool. That went out the window and cross stitch became my passion as a preteen probably. And that, but, but you also, having been to your house, you picked up on the uh, collector part too. You, you I'm have... a little bit of <laughs> an addict or a hoarder there. Megan's shaking her head. You can't see it, but she's shaking her head. If anyone gets a chance to go to Vicky's house, it is a treasure trove of old, cool stuff. So, yeah. Megan's house also. Actually, it kind of overflows into the annex at their house. Yeah, I don't have nearly as much, though. But when I'm over there babysitting the kids or we're over there, I always notice fun things on her walls. So, yeah, there's <laughs> okay. plenty of plenty of cow samplers to go around. So you're running a storage Very business. Generous. So you're running a storage business then, Megan, right? No, no. <laughs> I I have good boundaries. Oh, okay. <laughs> She's okay. very generous, and she, she'll pick up things that she thinks that I would enjoy, and she's usually spot on, and so those are the things that are hanging at our house. Okay. There's a filter at the door. All right. <laughs> so, Megan, how do you get into this? My I, I mean, you, you not only got involved, but you became the boss, so how did that happen? Well, that was unintentional. Um, my grandmother taught me how to stitch. She stitched stockings for all of her grandkids growing up, and she always had a project going at her dining room table, like just off to the corner so she could move it or bring it back. Um, and then when Patrick and I started dating, and Patrick's Vicky's younger son, um, we were just out of college and didn't have a lot of money. And we were talking about different things that we could get family for Christmas. And he was telling me how his mom's kind of a big deal in the cross stitch world. <laughs> and I said, you're kidding. I know how to cross stitch. And he goes, really? And I said, yes, my grandma taught me. I We should make her something. What should we make her? So at the time, I didn't know that there were shops that existed for cross stitch things because I hadn't really um, gotten into it that much. It was something I did as a child and then took a long break. But we went to Michael's, I want to say it was, um, and we picked out a design that was more um, his father's style because we figured that they could appreciate it together that way. Um, mind you, I didn't know Vicky that well at this time, like Patrick and I had been dating maybe six months or so. Um, so that's what we did. Um, it was not a Christmas present that year. In fact, it took me like two and a half years <laughs> to finish. Um, but I did get it finished and that's actually how I began our partnership with Needlework Press was, um, she was doing a home tour and I was helping with one of the rooms here because we had just moved out here that spring and this was in the winter time, I want to say January. And at the end of it, I, I don't know, I think when you're around um, people who love cross stitch and who love this art form, it's contagious. And so at the end of it, I very sheepishly, sheepishly asked her if I could show her something that I had been working on for them. And so I showed her what I had stitched and I asked her if she would allow me to be a model stitcher for Needlework Press to help her out some. And so that's how I got involved because she said, of course. Well, the reason I said, of course, Gary, is because Megan said, well, what I stitched isn't really like what you stitch. And she brought out a piece that had to have at least 70 or 80 different colors. And it was a beautiful scene of a man on a dock with his dog and he was fishing. You could see the planks, you could see the leaves on the trees. And if that woman could stitch this piece, she could <laughs> stitch any sampler out there. She had to change color 
thousands of times. Way to go and, low key, Megan. Way to go yeah. low key. <laughs> I, I went big. <laughs> and so she, she said, well, I don't know. It's not like anything you stitched. And my, my jaw kind of fell. And, <laughs> <laughs> and so it, it's beautiful. And it hangs in Niall's office. And quite honestly, it looks like his father who um, was a fisherman. And it's, it's a beautiful piece of art that she created. And from there on, I was like, yeah, baby, you can model stitch all you want. <laughs> In There's your sleep. <laughs> There's a problem. Three children intervened. And so my faithful model stitcher is sidetracked. Right. And not only that, but I didn't, I couldn't keep up with all of it. So now we collaborate on things and yeah, it's, we've done lots of different things over the last nine years working together on this. Yeah, yeah, it's been an evolution. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah, raising three kids and trying to do stitching. Yeah, that takes some, yeah, takes a lot of things. <laughs> Organization, only one of them. Yeah. Jeez. Right. Megan yeah. just recently um, hem-stitched our latest reproduction sampler. It's a small sampler. And I think maybe that's that's part of the direction we've gone as we get more products and more allied things um to needlework, we are tackling less cumbersome projects, mainly because our lives don't allow. Right. Yeah. So, all right. So, the, Vicky, you have a collection of samplers, and, and pretty amazing collection, quite frankly. And I'll, I'll put a link. I did a video at Vic, Vicky's house with Vicky and Megan. Uh, I'll put a link for that. That was some time ago, but um, I'll put a link so people can see that video and see what some of their collection but now the the ones that you've produced and are producing, are you actively collecting or are you still working off of your uh, your stash of, of original samplers? Both. I would say a little bit of both. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we don't anymore purchase something unless it speaks to both of us. I kind of consult with Megan um, because she has to shake her head and say no, Vicky, sometimes, because I would give every orphan sampler a home if I could. And 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 we work together quite well on that, about the practicality of it, wall space. There are so many beautiful samplers in the marketplace that have been reproduced now. And so we really try to add something that has a unique feature. Would you say that's mm -hmm. kind of true? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah you, we, you we, guys, you guys tend to find smaller samplers, which I find interesting because I mean, there's obviously a ton of large samplers, but uh, I, I've thought many times there's there's a real place for smaller uh, reproduction samplers, and uh, um, <laughs> you know, I'm working on Sarah Brazier right now, which is gigantic monster of a thing, but um, which I think I'm going to be saying that I'm working on that for the next twenty years, but whatever. Uh, <laughs> It's but, okay. I'm still working on Megan's husband's birth sampler, Gary. Oh, there we go. Okay. I feel better. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So that's 30 plus years. So there right. you go. Okay. I'm good. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, you, you, I'm affirming, I'm affirming you in your undertaking. Oh, Vicki, you're my hero. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but, but there is, I think there's a real place that maybe isn't as, as an exploited is the wrong word, but, uh, uh, needs to be a, a approached more for smaller samplers. Am I right? Or am I just not connected with that end? You know, I'd say there's a good mix out there of both, but a lot of times there are two different purposes that I think people take on. If you want to do a big project, it's either for a special occasion or to fill a space on a wall or because something speaks to you. A lot of times we do the small samplers as a gift for a friend you know, uh, a birthday kit, gift to commemorate something. Um, so, yeah, there's a good mix of them. But but recently, I think there have been more large than small samplers on the market. I mean, yeah. think of it. Yeah. Yeah, without, yeah, a, without one, a doubt. Yeah. And that's I guess that's where, where that, that question and thought comes from, is that we have no trouble finding medium and large size samplers everywhere. Uh, and, and the little ones, I think you almost have to seek out and uh, lately, I've been thinking, boy, th those because obviously stitch much stitch up much faster. But there's a place for those and, and a, a counter to these large ones. Yeah, Megan just finished hem stitching one um, that's dated 1882. It's a bit late, but it's a really sweet um, 
monochrome red and red red just seems to be one of the most popular colors in samplers as i'm sure you've noted but this one's a really cute alphabet sampler just dated with the location it was made in 1882 and we're having a hard time on this one figuring out if it was made at an infant's school or a school in the town that was set up for um poppers for for people who had mm. no place to live and no place to go We'll probably never know because there's not a name on it, but we have the town and we have the date. And um, yeah, that one, it's red. Since it's red with a blue border um, and on ECRU, we're going to get that out before the 4th of July. No. Oh. That history, boy, that history is so fun. There's something different with everyone. And I think that's part of the reason we both love samplers. Agreed. Yeah. 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 So uh, that, that's interesting. You, you said uh, what, 1882 was kind of late. What, where where do we draw, I mean, I, I'm sure it's a sloppy line, but where do we draw the line in terms of reproduction samplers? Uh, at, at what date is it like, all right, this is a little modern era? You know, I would say late Victorian, you know, late 1800s, early 1900s, samplers stopped being a part of traditional education for the most part. Stitching took place. But certainly most of the samplers we like are 18th and 19th century. Mm -hmm. When you get into more contemporary ones, maybe they don't hold their charm because some of them were hanging in our houses and they were the things that went to garage sales and maybe because it's older. I, you know, I can't tell you why, but when we talk about reproduction samplers, they pretty much ended in the 19th century. And, and, and it yeah, was that it was that ending of using it as an educational tool that that correct yeah correct yeah and and then as we get into the 1900s there was a lot of beautiful stitching done um it was just a different type of stitching we started to get into some printed cross stitch um uh, more needlepoint um and the cross stitch became more embroidery. More, yeah, maybe more embroidery than cross stitch. And our passion is definitely counted cross stitch. Yeah, yeah. The um, the stamped cross stitch. We don't see that really anymore at all, do we? Ironically, it's returning some really? among Megan's age group. There is more stamped cross stitch coming out now. A lot of people are doing it in hoops and using the hoop as the frame. Um, I don't know whether it will become you know, really popular or not, but it is, I think they see it as a DIY craft, perhaps more than um, they do a needle art. Hmm. In fact, I see a lot of it. If you look, if you look and it's, it's a lot of them are posted under embroidery as opposed to cross stitch, but, okay. but I, I've just seen more in the last few years. Like on Instagram? On Instagram, on Facebook. Um, yeah, I've seen I've seen more of it than I have than I have since the '60s or '70s, to be honest. That's interesting because I thought that had just kind of faded into history. No, it 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 seems to be coming back some. There there are a few designers that design on a muslin type fam uh, fabric, and they're actually kind of nice. Hmm. So yeah. All right. I don't I don't think you'll see them in my hoop, but but um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, no, I learned something again. See, it happens every time. So then, you have the you have the the uh, uh, reproduction samplers, and then you start branching out. When when do you start branching out into to offering uh, printed materials? What because you you do quite a bit. I mean, you you do some writing, Vicky, and wh how does that come into play? You know, I do actually. It's kind of a toss up whether I like writing or writing about me to work more. Um, when Megan and I were really fortunate to collaborate on two books um, that were published by Kansas City Star Press, which is no more. And in those books, we were able to incorporate um, both writing projects, history, um, some beautiful art, some beautiful art in those books. And a lot of times the samplers beg to be written about um, and researching the history is a lot of fun. Sometimes there's not much there, but when there is, we write about it. Um, 
the book was a joint effort by both of us. Um, the second book, the first one Megan helped a lot with, but um, wasn't a co-author on. And then I think because there's so few products out there related to needlework, we kind of branched off into doing little notebooks. Um, microfiber putting, cloths. Yeah, putting needlework on microfiber cloths. Um, we a calendar for a long time, though, with... Yeah, and we do a calendar. Samplers. We do a um, Stitcher Enthusiast Book of Days every year, and I can't even think how far back that goes. 2010, maybe? No, before that, because you used to have them... Binding. Spiral bound. Yeah. It started out being spiral bound. Um, the Book of Days has but been really grown. popular. Yeah. And has grown in popularity outside the needlework world. I have teachers who ask for it. Um, they like it because you open it up and you see a month at a glance. And inside are images from samplers, vintage images that we own. We collect a lot of ephemera. We are kind of nerds about collecting quotes ephemera. Samplers quotes versus... from samplers. Um, and it's just, it's really fun to share allied products um, with people who love needlework. Yeah, that, that's what I think is fun about your business is is just that is it's uh, it's not just samplers. There's all the little little things that go with it that enhance the experience. Yeah, we're um, we're always looking for fun new little things. In fact, we have some surprises that I can't reveal um, that will be part of summer school classes we're teaching in August, and I hate to reveal them because I don't want to um, ruin the surprise for the hundred people that will be attending summer school here in August, but they're, they're related to needlework, but they're definitely not needlework. And so it's looking for these things and coming up with um, unique ways to share our passion and maybe even move it outside of needleworkers to, to people who might love history, but even if they don't pick up a needle, they, they can appreciate the art form. Yeah, that uh, summer school now, two weekends, that's uh, the attic. Uh, for those who don't know, summer school is Jean Lee, the attic. Uh, what her, her attempt to generate some business in the summer when everybody's in the north that has gotten out of control <laughs> to the point where it went now two weekends. Uh, she, The demand was so high that she's added a second weekend this year. So you guys are teaching both weekends? We are, and it's very humbling for us because when we started this venture, we weren't even sure that we could fill up one weekend getting <laughs> people to come to Arizona during the summer. And so the fact that it's grown the way that it has is just amazing to us. Yeah, yeah and think, it's fun. I think for some people, it, get, getting into that thing is like getting into a Beatles reunion. It's like <laughs> sit at the at the machine, and the minute it's it's available, get signed up. That's an amazing Amazing event. And, uh, and yeah. it's, it's fun, Gary, because we're all Arizona designers. Right. Um, and we, we've joked that we need to um, come up with a cooperative project among us and call ourselves designers from the desert or designers in the desert. And we've all been so busy, we haven't gotten around to it. But it, it, it is just an amazing blessing to have so many talented designers right here in our backyard and and we collaborate with them sometimes or if we're out of a certain count of fabric i recently needed a dark 36 count fabric so you know i could text our neighbors five miles down the road and say hey do you have you know a cocoa and 36 count and we love having the attic here but you know after a big event all the fabrics we mean need may not be there so we can rely on one another and it's it's just a lot of fun to get together we're all so busy, we don't do it that much, but summer school brings us together and, and we have fun just just sharing, getting in out of the 112 degree August days. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't think people realize the number of offspring from the attic that have your own little businesses and designs and so on and so forth. It's quite a community. Mm -hmm. it, it is. is. It is. And, and having, I think we sometimes take for granted what we have in our backyard. I agree. Yeah. And yeah. and it's just, you know, I mean, even us to go to the attic, like Megan, now that she's got the kids, you don't get there as much. Megan, did, no. Megan and I both used to work at the attic, as a matter of fact. Yes. Well, it's all, all of you did, right? 
Well, yeah, and and Tanya did, and I'm trying to think. I don't Linda think Linda Dan did. Linda Vincent did. I don't think Linda Danielson or, or Gloria Gloria did. But yeah, four of us me. used to work at the attic. Yeah, yeah, and it's been my first trip to the attic was one two four locations ago, and um, Jean was a partner. She had two other partners, I believe, in the shop. And I mean, it was a Mecca then and it's a Mecca now. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, but that's the, it's the uh, I mean, that shop and, and, and what it represents and what it does is is outstanding. But then if, if you know a little bit about the history of of designers who have come off of that, it, it you really start to appreciate what Jean has has done through the years, just with her love of samplers primarily. And it's uh, it's pretty amazing stuff. And her encouragement of us when we get discouraged. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, that's the you know that's the other part is yes, uh, encouragement all the way around from Jean. Uh, yeah, yeah, she's something else. So Megan, you're doing a uh, solid <laughs> cross stitch project as a gift, and then mm -hmm. then you actually get to ease up on the on the pedal and do samplers where you don't have to cover every piece of of cloth. How how does your stitching evolve? Because, uh, I mean, you, you, you're going to, you learned some cross stitch, you did a big project, and then you run into Vicky and uh, you're doing samplers. Do you, you fall in love with samplers? Is it an evolution? Do you still have other stitching interests outside of samplers? For me, it's mostly samplers. Um, besides, well, so I love the history, like Vicky touched on earlier, that comes with the samplers. I was unaware of any of that stuff. I only knew that there was solid stitching and dimensions kits and things like that from growing up because that's what my grandma did and that's what my cousin did. Um, so I think the history with those, and I love the charming aspects of samplers. Like uh -huh. we, we like a lot of folksy samplers with interesting people or um, motifs or alphabets even. And so, yeah, I'm a sampler girl. I don't think I would ever go back to solid stitching. Like <laughs> it'd have to be something really, really special <laughs> to go back to that. I wanted to get into embroidery. I think it would be fun. I have a friend who borrowed some of my embroidery books a year ago um, and she got into it, but and I sew some, but not as much as I would like to because I don't have space right now to have it set up. And it just seems like a chore to get sewing stuff set up and taken down so that it's safe for kids. <laughs> Megan has some real talent, Gary, in color. Her background is in um, theater design. Oh. And so she's got a great eye for color. Yeah, that my degree's in technical theater with an emphasis in lighting design. Oh. And so when it comes to picking colors usually i will defer to her she she really has a great eye for color and we might discuss three or four different colors and options but overall um i i think megan's training really helps a lot when she's putting colors together so that's a real plus then the two of you together you guys when you talk about collaborating you truly can collaborate on a, on a sampler uh, and, and cover all aspects of it. That's great. Yes, very much so we work together. Yeah, and when I say Megan's the boss, it's probably because she's a firstborn child and has no problem saying, you know, Vicki, <laughs> no, I don't think that quite works. And she's usually right, darn it. <laughs> yeah, but I think it's also our relationship. I mean, because you're a firstborn also, so we just, We've always been honest with one another from the very beginning, and that's made it so that we can have a genuine and authentic relationship. So Yeah, and when it comes to how to finish a piece, for example, our, our summer school project, we both love the sampler. I mean, we're in love with the sampler that inspired the project, and it has several elements. And um, part of it was stitched, and I was thinking, oh, a little pencil case, a little scissors case. And um, Megan came up with a great idea. And at first I kind of balked. I mean, honestly. Yeah. 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 And um, then I thought about it and I'm like, oh my gosh, it's perfect. So um, 
we we are able to collaborate in a way that I think makes, you know, one and one doesn't equal two. I think we're able to offer better products um, because of that collaboration. Yeah. Do you, uh, other than stitching the samplers for the business, do you guys get a chance to stitch just whatever you want? I make attempts. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I, <laughs> okay. I don't finish a lot. <laughs> I, I try to do um, a stitching project every five years for our anniversary. And if it's any indication, I did great up to 25 and, now I'm working on our 40th anniversary sampler and we will be selling our celebrating our 43rd anniversary. There we and go. And I, I took on that tradition also and I gave Patrick our five year anniversary sampler for our seventh anniversary. Mm-hmm. And um we will be married ten in November and I am probably a third of the way done with that. Yeah. So so we, we attempt to do it. The the <laughs> You guys are right on schedule. I think yours perfect. <laughs> we both um, we both have day jobs. Neither of them full time, but we both work at our churches as the communications person. Ironically, um, I've been doing that for almost twenty years, and Megan's six. been doing it at her church for six years. So we do all of the website, written bulletins, publications, that kind of thing. So we also have parallel day jobs. Um, in addition to need to work press and family life and family life. Well, yeah, yeah, there is that yeah, we get together a lot, and our, so. um, and our husbands both support us in this. They're just kind of yes, cool. They, mm-hmm. they really do. They, they enjoy it. They, they don't balk when we bring home new samplers or they don't balk at the mess on the dining room table or the shipping boxes that are stacked on the porch. Um, so they're very, they're very supportive and actually really interested in it too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, just talking, Vicky, with your husband when I visited, uh, the history part, he, he is definitely oriented that way. So I can see why he would be supportive because, um, boy, he the history of Arizona, he opened my eyes. And, um, yeah, so he has that orientation anyway. I mean, we would love to find an Arizona sampler that was actually stitched here in the 1800s and territorial days. I, I'm not even sure that any exists. We've checked with all the museums in the state and they don't have any. Um, we do have a sampler that was stitched by the mother of the first mayor of Phoenix. She never came here, but her son, John Alsop, um, was the first mayor of Phoenix. And so it's kind of cool to have a sampler that commemorates his birth. Yeah. So, yeah. and ironically, the friend who found it has an antiques. Um, business both here and in New Hampshire. And so she found that for us. Oh, that's neat. Now that's, you know, the other thing that I enjoyed visiting you is all of the uh, things that you've collected. And you posted here just the other day, a box full of scissors that you had. You really, it, it's it's much more than the samplers. You really have a tremendous collection of of stitching and sewing accessories, notions, whatever we want to call them from way back. And that's uh, to me, that adds that extra dimension to what you guys do. Yeah, Megan and I both love those too. Mm-hmm. But Vicky is quite the treasure hunter. Like, it's very cool to be out with her because she will find things that I think most people would pass by and she'll just look real quickly because Vicky looks real quickly and she'll just hone in and find the neatest things. And I attribute that to my dad taking me to antique shows as a child. He, you know, they, they call people that, that search out antiques for, for dealers. They have their pickers that go around picking. And so maybe I'm, maybe I'm kind of a picker, but it, it is so much fun. And again, a lot of the things we collect, people might pass over. Um, one year for summer school, um, Megan made felt hands. It was a little thimble holder, and they were two felt hands holding a little basket that you could put your thimble in and um, just being able to recreate that and offer that to people today, just to slow down and appreciate some of these little things that were trinkets and treasures that we don't even think about today, but in the past meant a lot. Think about what a needle would have meant to someone traveling the country. If they're going from 
the East Coast to the Midwest or the Midwest to the West, to Utah or Colorado, if you lost that sewing needle, you may only have one or two. And if you go over a bump and you lose that sewing needle, there may not be any at the general store for months. And, you know, here we are, we can buzz over to the attic and, and buy our new John James Petites and it's not a problem. <laughs> yeah. Isn't that true? Yeah. You don't think about that. I mean, I, I stitch with, you know, easily half a dozen or more needles on a needle minder for any project and don't even think a thing of it. But yeah, if you only had one or two and lost one in the dirt somewhere along the way, um, ouch. Yeah. You know, and the, the, the very ephemeral nature of needlework itself. I mean, you know, the charts are paper, the early charts, once they were printed, were printed on really, um, oh, kind of low grade paper. So a lot of them disintegrated and, and the needles and just everything that went along with it. it it's kind of of a throwaway nature. And um, all these things were treasured at one time. So to find some that actually survived um, is really amazing. Megan, it's got to be fun to watch somebody with Vicky's background go through an antique show or shop. Because there's got to be a real art to being able to go through and, and identify things that matter. It, it is. It's very fun. Um, like I said, I might pass things by and she'll hone right in on something <laughs> and show me. And I'll think, oh, that's so cool. I didn't even see that. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, at times, I think I could like probably be referred to as a hoarder, though, because it, it's hard to leave something on the shelf that someone else might pass up and not treasure and appreciate. So I suppose someday um, Zoe is going to have a lot of things to decide if, oh my gosh, do I want to keep this or do I not want to keep it? The other thing that's cool by, by saving and rescuing it is maybe it's a hundred or 150 years old when we acquire it, but by the time we're gone, it might be close to another hundred years old. So these, these things will become like true antiques. Some are just collectible, but over time they become true antiques. And so, you know, Zoe can pass this love on. Zoe's Megan's six-year-old daughter. Okay. She gets to go to market. She gets to go to market again this year too. She hasn't been in a few years. <laughs> She's very excited. And, and she loves going to market. Her, her favorite friend at market is, is Miss Gigi Miss from Gigi. GGR Designs. Oh, okay. she, <laughs> she and Miss Gigi have formed a bond. Uh-oh. <laughs> Well, that, you know, and that whole thing, the, the history, the things in antique shops, we've been uh, talking here at home about uh, selling and moving to downsizing and, all right, what do you keep? What do you get rid of? And uh, young people today just really don't want a lot of things. And so you think, oh, you hate to just throw them out, but the, the desire to keep them is not there. And you can't keep taking this stuff with you. And, and, you know, we have several things that have come from my relatives and from Marga's relatives that you just, you know, you got to have these. You can't just let them go to an auction or the trash. And you need to keep them around and keep them alive because that's the history of the family. And uh, uh, yeah, I, I fear a lot of that is going to get lost in the next 20 or 30 years as baby boomers retire and then move on. And a lot of that family history gets lost because there just isn't as much interest in, in the younger people in that kind of thing. Yeah, and we are. We're kind of, of stewards of those material items. And preserving history is so important. I worry about that with photographs, to be honest, that we have so much digitally now and we're not printing photos. And, I mean, there's nothing better than finding a really treasure photo from um the 1800s and and we're not we're going to kind of have all digital files so i don't know i don't know gary you make a really a really good point yeah and, and photos are, are probably at the very center of my thinking on this because we all have tons of them on our phones and we carry them but there's nothing that keeps them long term because they never get printed they get, right. they get shared, they get emailed, texted, whatever it is. But, yeah, they don't get printed. So there's no box of them that says this is family history. And, right. Uh, yeah, we, we had uh, um, uh, my wife's, the family farm, her uh, her uncle uh, farmed the family farm. And 
and recently uh, her cousins have been cleaning that out. And that's what they found is the boxes and boxes of family history. And uh, two of them that came out of it were when the farm was in its, in its heyday and all the buildings were there and the hay wagons and the horses and the house looked like a mansion. And, and those pictures now we've restored a couple of them and just about everybody in the family has printed them because that's the history. And people had forgotten that the farm actually had a name and wow. it was, it was on the barn, but you know, over the years, the letters had fallen off and, and, and all of that was, and, and now in these two pictures with the people, and of course, uh, Marga and the, and the cousins remember who the people are, uh, that's the history. And, and with the electronic stuff, uh, yeah, I'm with you. I fear it's just going to just disappear, and, and, but not to be found. And like everything else, it's a blessing and a curse because electronics have allowed us to learn so much about history to be able to connect. You know, before you had to write a letter to a museum and wait for it to get there and then yeah. hope it gets to the right person. Now we can email and get an answer from a museum. It, it So it's a blessing and a curse. And I'm, you know, I'm thinking about that, too, is what photos do we want to leave and what format do we want to leave them? Um, and, and the same with the needlework and our charts. I mean, one of the things we do, both Megan and I, is we collect charts. We may never stitch something, but wow there are some phenomenal charts that we have that we consider to be treasures, just like a book. Well, to be art. When I work at the attic, I would tell people that I'm like, it's okay to collect pieces, like charts that you're not going to stitch in this lifetime, because this is truly a piece of art. The designer not only reproduced this or designed it, if it's not a reproduction and it's original design, but they've taken the time to put together that chart. And it truly is a piece of art. Like, I have the Prairie Schooler alphabets, all of them, and I don't anticipate ever stitching those, but I think that they are so clever and I just love them. And so I have them. You, you yeah. just made a whole lot of people more comfortable with these stacks and stacks of charts that they own. Well done. Well, <laughs> good. well they should feel comfortable about that because it's like anything. You might not be able to put it up on your wall, but I guarantee if you pull out those charts and you look through them and you take the time to like really take it in, not just thumbing to find your next, pro your next project, but you look at them, I bet every person falls back in love with that design because it, it really is art. Yes. And sometimes it takes you back to when you bought it. Oh exactly. my gosh, I remember... I bought that when my mom was sick and in the hospital, and I remember it made me feel so good because things were just looking down, and it was just like, oh, my gosh. And so so the, the charts can kind of serve like an old photograph and, mm -hmm. and take you back. Yep. Okay, I feel better. My stack downstairs just got new value. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, so have you guys decided what you're going to do with your things when you downsize, or is it still in discussion? With my needlework? stuff your the family things oh no i don't know that's a real that's a yeah i don't know that's uh marga has boxed up boxed up some things that uh, you know i've just been sitting in a cabinet that she has never had out and those are easy but uh i think now we're down to the things that aren't easy and uh yeah i don't know i don't know uh, i just hate to see that stuff go away the um when my aunt uh moved out of her house to a nursing home and we had to clean out the house and, and uh, uh, the family member from uh, my uncle's side who was in charge of the estate was intent on uh, making sure that the stuff got preserved or whatever and he, and he wanted it to go to auction and sold and there were several things that Marga wanted because uh, my aunt was a real collector of uh, tea sets and there were several things that she wanted, but he wouldn't let go because he was in charge of getting the estate to an auction to be sold. And then we learned later that all of those things ended up at the auction and nobody wanted them. Oh, my God. You know, and it was, you know, give me two bucks and you can have this wagon load of stuff. And wow. it all, so it all just went to waste. And we comment every now and then about how that history and those beautiful pieces. And my aunt was one, she didn't buy cheap stuff. And so those beautiful, expensive pieces, 
basically just went to trash and it's it's almost sickening because that's you know that's history that's craftsmanship that's all the things that you know just went to waste and and so when it comes our turn it's like oh man is, is this going to happen again i don't know and you know we see the same thing with samplers sometimes yes we can go through our old samplers and look at some that were put in a basement and you can actually see the watermark on the sampler where there had been a flood in the basement or they had gotten damp from the bottom up and maybe there's a two or three inch area with a margin and you can see the watermarks um, where the damage occurred because something was put in a damp or wet basement. Likewise, some things that were put in the attic got bugs and dried out and they have dry rot. And so we can see that if not taken care of and not preserved, um, these little pieces of history, which do connect us with our ancestors and people who are otherwise forgotten, um, can be damaged. And 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 they do have they do have value. Um, so yeah, so it's 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 kind of an important consideration as we all age. Right. Well, yeah, and I, I I cannot get this out of my head, but when uh, Nicola was in in the country. And I, I hope that she showed this when she was at the attic, but the little sampler she's going to use for a, a workshop next year that uh, got taken out of the frame at Sassy Jack's, almost 400 years old. And I just can't get it out of my mind because you look at that and it, a piece of cloth, a stitched piece of cloth. But then if you if you take a moment, you realize that thing has been around for 400 years, a, a, a piece of art. 400 years old, almost 400 years old. And that needs to be preserved and it needs to be reproduced so that others can appreciate it. And um, yeah, we need to keep those things around. And I realize at some point we only have so much room in our houses, but uh, to let that stuff go, it just, it's almost painful. It is, it is. And I have, I mean, we have things upstairs. I, my mom kept some of our baby clothes and I can't decide, oh my gosh, what do I do with this? And they've got beautiful buttons and they have embroidery and they, in fact, Megan put Zoe in one of the dresses that was mine and it, it rapidly, as soon as she crawled in it, the, the chiffon kind of <laughs> disintegrated, but at least we have a picture of Zoe in a dress that was mine. Yeah. And so I think, oh, and a bathrobe. <laughs> Anything we could do to preserve and enhance an appreciation for this, I think is great. Um, here in town, we have some questers groups um, in Sun Lakes, who and the questers do a wonderful job of, of preserving an appreciation for history. And I think, you know, promoting it by going and doing talks at elementary schools. Um, recently, a, a friend from high school in Seattle started, I just learned, started an antique shop. It opened last week, and she said, Vicki, the first time I ever knew what an antique was was in high school when I came to your house for a party and your parents cooked dinner for all of us at the prom and your parents explained what was an antique. And here she is all these years later opening an antique shop in Seattle. <laughs> uh -huh. yeah. So so I, it, it never hurts to talk to people. Um, Niles, when you met Niles, he may have told you he's a dairy vet. He has a lot of meetings here and his office is full of antique dairy items and when people come in his office, they're they're just in awe, and they had no idea that people collect um, these old items from the past that people would have thrown away on the farm. And so, that's what we do with needle and thread, and we love it. Yeah. Would you guys consider your business to be a business of education, a business of re uh, uh, you know restoration? What? How? How would if if you had to put one word on it, what would that be? I would say education or appreciation. I was going to say appreciation, so she took okay. the word out of my mouth. <laughs> okay. It, it it definitely is not um, a business that's lucrative in terms of <laughs> um, money. That's not what that's not what it's about. We you know of course we like to cover our costs and be able to um, buy supplies and replenish our old samplers, but. It is definitely um, enhancing people's appreciation of of the history and the art form. Well, and you have to do the ones that speak to you also. Like, 
we don't choose samplers based on what we think other people are going to love. We choose ones that we love because of the amount of time you spend working on it, not just charting it, but stitching it and then putting together the charts and studying it. And if you can find the history, trying to get to know that, the amount of time that you spend with a, with a sampler, you have to reproduce things and share those things with people because you think that it's something special and worth sharing. Yeah, yeah. And, and isn't that so true because, and that's where the art part comes in. Because how many musicians, composers, writers, painters have been asked, you know, are you, do you create so that it will sell or do you create for you? And usually the ones that are most successful are the ones that create for themselves because it speaks to them. It's what they feel in terms of a song or a poem or something. And then if others like it, fine. But that's where the real, to me, the real art is, is that. Uh, as an artist or, uh, or people like you who reproduce, it, yeah, it speaks to me. It has meaning to me. Therefore, I put everything into it. And then if others like it, fine. If not, fine too. Yeah. Yeah, and we, we do. We we like to listen to people's suggestions. They'll say, oh, you know, we wish you would reproduce this one if they see something we have. Um, or, oh, we really like that. And we try to listen as best we can, but there are really truly only so many hours in the day. Um, and it's not something that you can mass produce. It takes time, the time to study, the time to chart, the time to pick colors, the time to stitch, to get framed. So it's it's not something um, that you can rush. And Megan and I, and we have um, one local gal who does some stitching for us, but we, we pretty much, um, do everything between the two of us and um, one other person who does the model stitching. So we're fairly limited in how much we can produce. One thing that I did not know you did, and in doing research for this, was uh, you're involved with cruises. What, what uh, describe that, what is that all about? You know, that is um, just a fortuitous opportunity that came our way um, our friend Maureen Appleton um, of the Heart's Content went on a couple of cruises with Stitcher's Escapes Cruises, and she talked to us and told us how much fun it was and how wonderful. And then lo and behold, um, we were invited to create a project and go on a British Isles cruise in 2020. And the opportunity was wonderful. And we said, yes, the hard thing was deciding would I go, would Megan and I go, would Niles and I go? <laughs> it, anyhow, uh, as it turned out, and maybe I have my three grandchildren to thank for this, <laughs> Niles and I are going to go. Um, and we loved it because there were some ports that we had never been to. And the wonderful thing about it is that the rooms where stitching takes place um, have lots of windows and lots of natural light. And it'll be perfect for um, some projects we have based on a, a British sampler. Mm. So yeah, this will be it'll be a first experience. Although we did all cruise as a family, all eleven of us for our fortieth wedding anniversary went to Alaska. So ooh, the, um, the one and only place in the world I'd do a cruise, Alaska. Yeah, it was amazing. You should do it. Yeah, you should. No, don't even think about it. Don't pass go. Take advantage of one of the. Um, this summer, just take advantage of a cruise isn't full. You and your wife go on it and just do it. It Alaska's incredible. Okay. Yeah. My right. six year old still talks about it and it was two years ago, right? Yeah. Yeah. That we went. Yeah. So she was four and she still talks about it. And it made it it made an impression on her. Wow. Very much so, yes. Uh, and it was our second cruise to Alaska and it, it, it is just a phenomenal experience. Um and we did take stitching along on that cruise, and I don't think we did much stitching, did we? No. Yeah. I don't think we both I did carried, any. We don't go, neither of us go anywhere without stitching. Um, maybe Megan doesn't carry it as much anymore now that she has the diaper bag full. <laughs> it depends. Like, I went to Washington with the three kids by myself for spring break. I did not take any then because I knew I would not have any time to yeah. do it. But if Patrick's along, then I'll usually bring something because I think, oh, maybe I'll get in a little bit of time here or there. 
but that's not always the case. And sometimes it's just thinking about doing it that's peaceful. You you may not get to it, but it, when we travel, I like to take it with me just in case there's that that extra time to sit and stitch. Right. Oh yeah. No, I I agree. That's um, uh, I think I mentioned a couple shows ago. I had a trip to uh, Vegas and uh, got out there uh, in the middle of the afternoon and had nothing the rest of the day. And uh, also a strange thing, the next night I didn't have anything. And it's a trade show, and that's very unusual. And so I took all my stitching, and oh, I, w I was going to get to the uh, room at 2 in the afternoon and had nothing. And we were between issues of the magazine, and so it wasn't like I had to proof pages or anything. And I was so looking forward to it. And I forgot my magnifier light, and I was stitching on forty count linen. And oh, Gary, yeah. <laughs> so, so the it, it, afternoon all the way into the evening, couldn't do it. I tried, I just couldn't see it well enough to stitch, and uh, it was just sickening. And I still remember that that whole block of time all wasted and lost. Yep. Well, you need to keep perforated paper with you. That's why we like perforated paper. It's easy to see. It's it, you can get lots of fun little projects done just keep some perforated paper in your in your computer bag and then you'll never not be able to see it now that's a good idea you know and that's the one when i was at your house that's the one that still sticks with me is that old perforated paper piece that you have there i still think that's amazing it was done by a boy right there was one of the, yes, one of the perforated paper pieces was done by a boy. And we're working with a friend of Megan's now to create a smaller count perforated paper. What's out there is 14 count. And we are just Ooh. really hoping, and we're, we're close. We're close. We have the second prototype. I just haven't gotten around to stitching on it. Um, and so we're really excited about that. Ooh, that so, interests me a lot because the 14 count, eh, yeah, you can take it or leave it. But ooh, no, what? the little, and I, I stitched on the first one. Um, right now you have to use a beading needle because the holes are, are quite small, but, um, yeah, in fact, I got a message the other day. He's like, Vicki, Vicki, what have you done? And I, <laughs> I haven't, so I need to, to pull that out and stitch on it. So is this going to be effectively 18, 20 counts, something like that? It's close to 20. Okay. It's close to 20. Um, it's small enough that you need to use a beading needle and, um, Tudor silk. Oh my. Yeah. So it's, it's that small and it, it covers really nicely. So, um, Ooh, that sounds it, like fun. It's in the works. I hopefully by Nashville this year, we'll, Ooh. we'll have some of that. So Ooh, yeah. that sounds like fun. All right. And you mentioned, you mentioned the queen sampler, um, that you're, yes. you guys are leading the stitch along. We are just really, really fortunate, um, to have, um, purchased the copyright on Darlene Osteen's amazing collection of needlework. Amazing. Um, oh, so you have the, just, her entire collection? We do, with the exception of her book, The Proper Stitch. We have got, we have everything. Um, we need to, we want to get a website up, Needles Praise. We bought the domain name. Um, we really want to make her projects available to the 21st century stitchers. So many people have not experienced um, her yet. So the, the Queen Sampler is just the first one that's been released. Um, we've, we've got them all. So it, it's, it's talk about a labor of love that, that will be coming. Yeah. There, and her instructions are just, you know, amazing. And then when someone like Linda Vinson, um, enhances those it, it opens up a lot of doors for people for for exploration of some beautiful stitching yeah oh i'll never forget in at nashville being in your room and seeing that queen sampler and what linda did with it um well i mean that's why i, I did the video and why we're we're going to do this this uh project because that to me i i just think there's very few uh designs of any kind that are as special as that that's just really unique and um, I love the challenge too. It's just... And when we talk about dense stitching, her projects are dense stitching. And, All of them? Um, most of them. Yeah. Most of them. Some are, are more intermediate, but um, there are some beautiful Celtic samplers, two Celtic samplers, Wallace and Robinson, um, that people are starting to show some interest in. So I, I, I think it's just pretty amazing that, that 
a new generation of needleworkers can discover Darlene because she's a true artist. Oh, that's exciting. Yeah. Great. All right. We got to end on, on that high note. Let's just end this thing. Thank you, uh, ladies, for doing this. Really have enjoyed it. Thank you. Thanks, Gary. Yeah. All right. And thanks to Sassy Jacks for sponsoring. And thanks to everyone for listening. Mm -hmm.